Hello, everyone, and welcome to our annual wrap-up of the Altium On Track podcast. 2024 was an incredible year full of new and returning guests, all of whom offer so much important knowledge that is vital to the PCB industry. Before we get started, I want to give a big thank you to our amazing roster of guests and our audience, because without you, none of this is possible. Now let's dive in. There is one area of electronics I have personally taken more of an interest in, and that is EMI and EMC. It's the other side of PCB black magic, dealing with testing and analysis of real products before they can be released to market. I had the privilege of talking with EMI experts about their experiences, how they approach testing, and the big EMI challenges PCB designers have to overcome. Let's take a look. Well, it's, it starts and ends with electronics, so your electronics is can be the source of emissions or the energy source of the emission. And we can also be become the victim of the external field. So it starts and ends with electronics. And in between is a coupling pad. And um, in, in, in the end, it's it's all mechanical. So if you think about it, uh, where you put your traces, if you imagine a trace above a ground plane, um, it, it's, it's, it's a mechanical thing. It's a, you have a copper plane, you have a copper piece and in between and around it is there there's a field so that's that, that that's how you can look at it from a from a pcb level um but that pcb is integrated in a system it's mounted uh with the housing there are cables attached to it cables lead to somewhere and that all affects how the electromagnetic fields uh, behave um so it, it's it's always mechanical and um, yes, one of the first things I, I look at, of course, is uh, is the electronics. Uh, if, if, this, if, if the electronics is um, causing emission, then it's, it's always best to tackle the problem at the source. So we look into the electronic design, see if we can uh, solve it there. Um, but next is um, making sure that the interference that leaves the, the PCB uh, can can come back and that the field is maintained. In, in a local area around the board. Obviously, with uh, measuring high impedance circuits, you really want to have a uh, high impedance network in your, in your probe. Um, but as we mentioned, high impedance is often difficult to achieve due to many reasons. Well, one of the main reasons is capacitive, parasitic capacitance that uh, basically become low impedance when the frequency goes above hundreds of megahertz. So if you read through uh, Doc Smith's uh, notes on how to uh, construct this, this tip, you can already see from this picture as well that, for example, we use five resistors in parallel, right? We can easily use one resistor, but why do we need five resistors in parallel? Well, simply to minimize the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the parasitics impact I mentioned. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's, if you look at the resistance value, actually they are not really high, you know, high impedance compared with, you know, thousands of, uh, ohms. They're not thousands of ohms, but still, in the frequency range of interest, hundreds of, of hundreds of ohms could still be high impedance. Usually, when a company has failed EMC and they start looking for outside help, they've probably gone through at least one round of testing. They've probably gone through multiple rounds of pre-compliance, and they're just they have no idea. So they're probably ready to try anything. Yeah, so if, if it's a radiated emissions failure, then that means there's a, a pretty good antenna somewhere on a PCB that they don't know of. And yeah. uh, basically, and it, it's either it's in a cable or it's in a, like an inductor. And uh, all it takes is just to find it. But yeah, because they don't want to find it, they just put a metal enclosure around it and try to like isolate it for a day cage it as much as possible and yeah it just some some of those amc fixes are insane <laughs> put put common mode chokes on everything <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, because they don't know what they're putting it on they put it everywhere like <laughs> Adding that capability really helps you compete with some of these other other firms who might be taking business from you yes that's a, that's a very good point uh, thanks for highlighting that. 
Um, this is this is also one of the big advantages and the game changer in our licensing model. Um, as as I as I meant, and that that's why I compare it to to a, a spell checker. For a spell checker, you don't pay per run. It's something you have a subscription mainly or a yearly license, and it it doesn't cost you more if you run it one time or a thousand times. And this is in our business model th the same. So you can come back with any small change. You always get the best EMC knowledge we have in the company. Um, and with, without any additional costs. And th this is something which is especially uh, in, the, in the beginning as we support from schematics to layouting and diff the different stages in the product development. Um, you don't need to finish your project, your layout, that you feel comfortable. This is what I see very often in classical consultant business. The, the engineers finishing the layout because they want to show something complete. They don't want to show something half uh, to, to an external person to get feedback. One of the big trends that has been growing over the past couple of years is ultra high density interconnect design and manufacturing or UHDI. Designers and manufacturers participating in this area are witnessing a broad convergence between semiconductor packaging and traditional PCBs. We were privileged to talk with several experts from the manufacturing world to get their take on UHDI design and manufacturing. Now about the jacking of the defect rates when you go to minimum, uh, the minimum footprint size or pad size, I should say. Um, what exactly are those defects? Are these too little solder, too much solder? Do, is it too, like tombstoning or shifting that leaves an open? We get tombstones, we get skews, we get midship solder balls, we get non-wets. It sounds like um, there's just the complete list. <laughs> there is, <laughs> there is. <laughs> There's probably you hit six most different of them, forms. right? Yeah, yeah. There's probably six different forms that we use um, of, of defects code. So, yeah. So, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember back to the study, but let's say in here we might be a thousand ppm. Okay. In here we might be two thousand ppm. In here we're like five or six. It was a huge, huge difference. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I would have to go back and look at the numbers from the study, but it was a very remarkable difference. So our logic told us, don't use the max, use the nom, try not to use the min. So it really sounds like fabricators, or not fabricators, but assemblers need to have some kind of strategies here for what they're going to do when they start finding more boards that are using pads even below the minimum IPC standard size. And you know what? I'm, I'm working on boards now that use even below the IPC minimum just because we have to get the density. I do think a lot of designers will just, you know, click the tin lead button or not the tin lead, but the, the <laughs> immersion tin button on their quote form online, or they'll click the yeah. email button and they'll just yeah. say, yeah, you know, go for it. I, and I don't know, maybe if I can make this comment, they click on a button, I don't know, uh, from a designer perspective or from, you know, placing an order uh, at PCB uh, fab house, whatever is cheapest, right? So let's pick the one which is the cheapest. Uh, you know, because nowadays every uh, everything is an online uh, application where you are filling out all the forms with the, you know, drag down uh, options and all right, whichever, whichever is the cheapest, let's pick that. But yeah, I mean, you have to, some of the, some of the thing is, yes, one has to know the reflow passes as you brought up. Uh, second is the cost, but you have to be very judicious of cost because there are other surface finishes that I can bring up like uh, Enipig, if uh, uh, it, you may be aware of, because a lot of time with the higher application, higher reliability application, palladium layer is put, uh, uh, you know, between nickel and gold. And one of the reasons is the black pad with Enig is historically a corrosion between nickel and gold layer uh, at that interface. And to prevent that, uh, palladium layer was introduced. And that is why Enipig is what is called electroless nickel, electroless palladium immersion gold is the full form of that. Yeah, it's really interesting to see all of this kind of take place. And I, I have to be honest, I was a little skeptical at the level of support that people were going to uh, uh, put put forward towards trying to reshore some of PCB production. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was in Washington, D.C., and it's very encouraging to see there are so many 
moving parts from so many different federal departments working towards this one goal of, you know, bolstering our supply chain in, in semiconductor in America from from Department of Energy to Department of Defense to Department of Commerce. So um, it's very it's it's very hopeful, I think. Sustainability has always been an evergreen theme in the electronics industry, but recently it has taken more of a focus as macro trends like electrification start to dominate our world. This reaches all areas of the electronics industry, starting from component recycling, reaching semiconductor design, and culminating with finished products. Our experts bring a unique perspective on these issues, so let's see what they have to say. First of all, you have your customers. customers increasingly want to buy from companies that they think are sustainable, doing the right thing, not destroying the planet. Employees, similarly, employees want to work for companies that are doing good. Nobody wants to work for evil corp. You know, so there, there's that. So if you are telling a good sustainability story and can show it and shore it up with data. If you have a good sustainability story, you will find it easier to attract and keep customers and you will find it easier to attract and keep employees. So that's, you know, both sides of the equation. It gets your re re recruitment and retention costs down and it gets your costs of customer attraction down as well. I mean, it, what you're describing, right, there's a town where they take in everything and they, you know, filter out the good devices. Then there's another town where they try and, you know, do repair. It sounds like there's yet another town where they just have piles of scrap, whatever couldn't be reclaimed, repaired, resold. Who knows what happens to it, right? It just ends up lying around. Is that is that really the case? I mean, are people just walking around through, you know, piles of, of electronic scrap? in some of these countries? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, the, the area we were in um, is, is known as Old Fadama, and it's, uh, it's, it's within Accra. It's within Accra's boundary. So it's four kilometers from the capital. So what's that, about three miles? Maybe not even from the center of the capital city. So, you know, if you try and picture that distance from your house, it's, it's bloody close. At least with, you know, designers, under, I think designers understand when they're working on an individual board and selecting the processor and, and those kinds of things that, you know, oh, yeah, they have to, to minimize, um, you know, they have to minimize their energy consumption. A lot of times they're operating off a battery or whatever. Um, but it, it's almost like at the system level, the, the ball has rolled downhill so far that you're creating this, this problem of power consumption all over the place just with IoT. We're not even talking about AI, EVs, and those other, you know, really power-hungry applications where there's also going to be an energy issue. No, just a little something that's watching a sensor and deciding if there's ever going to be a problem with whatever it's measuring and which is solving a cut and tried problem, one that can be as in the in you know in the axes of control in the in the in the levels of control. The one that I like best is supervisory control where all you do is give a set point to a device or give a, a target to a device or an assignment. You do what you need to do, but don't use more power than this and let the device work within those constraints. It's not that the device now has to figure out how to do it. The device was programmed to know how to do it. And it's merely told what the, today's limits are. That's a straightforward, tractable problem. And finally, it wouldn't be an electronics podcast if we didn't mention AI. From AI-based design tools to implementation in manufacturing and even running LLMs on small microcontrollers, AI has gone from buzzword to real products at lightning speed. Let's hear what our guests have to say about this transformational set of technologies. Are we in a situation where AI is still a solution looking for a problem and people are just willing to throw money at it until that solution gets married to a problem? But from my experience, clearly that's happening. I have talked with companies who have been funded with no uh, defined product. That's interesting. That, this, this feels like the dot-com era a little bit. Um, actually, it's quite frustrating. I, uh, you know, having um, had the experience of having to raise funds for my prior companies, um, uh, and, uh, you know, making the uh, pilgrimage to uh, what we called VC Gulch up in uh, Palo Alto for funding. 
um, and then being um, jilted by uh, you know younger folks with far less uh, polished what well you know we thought we were going there with nice polished business plans anyway they would come out with funding with far less polished uh, business plans that we had so it's it was frustrating then it's frustrating now to have somebody come and uh, uh, talk to us uh, you know again going back to my activities in the score organization and say, okay, I received this funding. Um, I need a product. What do you guys suggest? <laughs> the one thing I'm wondering is what have traditionally been the challenges involved in even getting all that data in the first place and then processing it um, as it's being generated on the factory floor? Because I, I assume in some in yeah. some settings, you may need to do this almost in real time. No, for sure. Yeah. In almost all cases, it needs to be done in real time. Um, there's, you know, we're not talking about you know, microseconds, but we're talking about seconds. You know, I need data available before I need to make a decision, um, before the next process cycle begins down the factory line. So, you know, there's a number of challenges. And I would say at the core, one of one of the core pieces is you need to put together three very different domains or skill sets. So one is, you know, deep software expertise. How do you actually build and deploy a system at scale across thousands of factory lines? that can talk to thousands of pieces of equipment that are very different, you know, taking all their information, do it in real time, be able to manage it at scale, be able to deploy it and make sure it's up and working, have good data quality. So that's, that's a core set of expertise. So I, I want a little space from some other approaches I've seen. So one is like, yeah, it is absolutely driven by the designer. Like there's no done button. You're not kicking it off to like, oh. AI will place and route your whole board and you won't touch it. Like what's the role of a designer in the future? Nothing. I don't, I really don't believe in that. So it's highly interactive and it's really meant to be layout as an optimization tool. It knows all the constraints. It's creating valid geometry. And then you as a designer can basically create fully qualified layouts at the speed where you might do a routing study. Right. What if everything was as fun as routing studies? But then your your design is also fully SCI closed. You recently did a video um, about the uh, using OpenAI or using ChatGPT to basically reduce the size of an LLM so that it eventually got small enough to where it could run on an edge device very quickly. This is coming to the edge, yeah, 100%. The big problem here is that the fundamental architecture, right, has not changed between GPT-2 and GPT-4. The parameter count has increased to, I'm mean, gonna look this up, to 1.76 trillion parameters for GPT-4 is what people guess, right? Um, and if we're looking at like where GPT-5 will go, probably not in a completely novel architecture that's gonna do this in a lot less parameters. It's probably gonna double or, or triple yet again, right? Um, and that helps if you're running in a data center with unlimited compute, um, but not so much if you want to put it to the edge. Once again, thank you to all of our guests and our audience for helping make 2024 a banner year for the Altium On Track podcast. I hope you all enjoy the holiday season and I'll see you right back here next year.